Okay, hello everybody, good morning. Um, you are encouraged to approach the stage, the acoustics is much better, that's what we were told. Uh, welcome to the generative modeling and synthesis session. I'm Eli Shechtman from Adobe, and this is Mingyu Liu from NVIDIA, and we'll be uh, uh, chairing the session. Um, the talks will be divided into triplets, and after every three talks, the next authors during the Q&A are encouraged to go and sit on these three black chairs. Um, the audience is encouraged to come and uh, ask uh, questions uh, using one of the microphones or through the slido.com website where the code is ICCV2019 underscore D1. Again, slido, ICCV2019 underscore D1. Um, okay, anything else? That's all? Yeah, let's so. get started. Yeah, let's get started. So the first uh, speaker is Ramin Abdal. Um, we'll be talking about image to style gen, how to embed images into the style gen latent space. And this is a joint work with Yipeng Chin and Peter Wonka. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Ramin Abdal. I'm from KAUST. Today, I will present our paper, Image to StyleGAN, how to embed images into the StyleGAN latent space. StyleGAN, proposed by Keras and others, is state-of-the-art in synthesizing high-quality and realistic-looking images. Since StyleGAN enables semantic image modifications, we believe it would be exciting to modify a given image rather than a randomly generated one. Our work aims to answer the following questions. If it's able to embed images into its latent space, what types of images can be embedded? What is the quality of the embedded images? And what semantic modifications can be performed? Example embeddings are shown in this figure. The top row uh, represents the original images and the bottom row shows the embedding results. Even though StyleGAN was trained on uh, human faces, uh, any image including non-faces can be embedded well. In the following, we will discuss three design choices for computing an embedding. Which latent space to choose? The original StyleGAN generator has two networks, a mapping network that maps a random code Z to a latent code W, and a synthesis network that uses W to generate images. More specifically, the latent code W is first adjusted by function A, and then used by adaptive instance normalization layers to steer the synthesis network when expanding a small 4 cross 4 resolution image to a 1024 cross 1024 image. An important insight of our work is that it's not easily possible to embed into the original 512 dimensional W space, hence we propose a W plus space, which is a 15, 18 cross 512 dimensions. It significantly improves the effectiveness of the space, the expressibility of the space, hence it improves the embedding results. What is the quality of the embedded images? This figure shows how W space embeddings are different from W plus embeddings. Here, the first column represents the original images. The second column represents W space embeddings with random network weights. The third column represents the uh, W space embeddings with mean phase vector initialization. And the D column represents the W space embeddings with uniform, uh, with random sampling initialization. And the uh, other columns are of W plus space. As you can see in the highlighted images, W plus images are quite good. What latent codes to choose for optimization? Uh, what is the initialization? Uh, initializing, the mean, initializing with the mean face latent code produces higher quality for faces. For non-face images, random initialization yields better quality. As the table shows, embedded non-face images are far, far from the mean face in the latent space. Which loss functions to choose? We use two types of loss functions, MSC pixel level uh, loss and the VGG perceptual loss. The first column shows the original images. The second column shows the results of MSC pixel loss only. The third to fifth columns uh, show embedding results using high, medium, and low level VGG network loss respectively. Uh, the last highlighted column shows the uh, results of the best combination of these losses, VC 
uh, that the, uh, they are embedded well. Now we uh, focus on the semantic modifications. The first one is image morphing. We simply do a linear interpolation of the latent codes and the changes translate semantically to the image domain. The morphing results between the faces is high quality. For the non-faces, it's of low quality. Interestingly, we see face structures in the morphed images. This implies the face structure is embedded in the content layers where the colors are impainted by the style layers. We perform style transfer uh, using the crossover operation. Uh, the, here are the results uh, when we embed a stylized image and then do, uh, then do the uh, latent crossover operation. The results are also of high quality. We can also perform, we can also perform the uh, uh, expression transfer where we transfer expression from one face to another. As you can see, the results are also of very high quality. These are some more examples. As you can see, even the stylized images can be used for style trans uh, for expression transfer. This is a small video uh, that we made out of noisy image via webcam. As you can see, it's still able to capture the expressions, and it works for the stylized images as well. Conclusion. We investigate an efficient framework to embed a given image into the style GAN latent space. Any image can be embedded. The quality of the image is quite stable, and then we show various applications of morphing, style transfer, and expression transfer. Next speaker, please. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Shuayang from Peking University. I'm glad to present our work entitled Controllable Artistic, Artistic Text Style Transfer via Shape Matching Game. This work is cooperated with Texas A&M University and Adobe Research. Our starting point is artistic text style transfer. It aims to render the target text in the style specified by a reference style image. We can see that as the shape deformation of the text increases, it reveals great artistry, but also becomes hard to recognize. Therefore, there is a trade-off between the um, legibility and the artistry. In view of the above, we are motivated to investigate a new problem of fast controllable artistic test stylization. We introduce an additional parameter L to control the deformation degree and aim to adjust the text shape based on L freely to allow users to select the most desired one. Our main idea is a novel bidirectional shape uh, matching strategy, including two stages. We first extract the structure map from the style image. In the first stage, uh, we backward transfer the uh, shape style of the text to the structure map, obtaining its sketchy or simplified version. In the second stage, we learn the forward mapping from the sketchy structure map to the original structure map, and further to the original style image. By doing so, our network can characterize the shape and texture features of these style images and transfer these images to the target text. But we will face two challenges. First, with only one reference style uh, image available, how to train our network. Second, how to train one network to support multiple deformation degrees. Let's see our solution. First, in the first stage, we train a sketch module to simplify the structure map. To obtain enough data, we randomly crop the style image, its structure map, and a sketchy structure map into sub-image pairs to gather as our training set. For our sketch module, we use Gaussian blur to map both the text and the structure map to the same smooth domain. Then we train a deep learning network to restore the text image from the smooth domain, thereby learning to simplify the structure map. To simplify the structure map, uh, in different levels, we use parameter L to control the standard, standard deviation of the Gaussian kernel and condition the deep learning network with L. The larger the parameter L, the greater the blurring, leading to higher simplification level or deformation degree. In the second stage, we train network GS to map sketchy structure maps of different simplification levels back to the original structure map. 
We empower GS with the proper the controllable REST blocks to learn the challenging multi-scale transfer. It is a linear combination of two REST blocks weighted by L. When L equals to zero or one, controllable REST blocks degrade into the original REST blocks and solid deal with the tiniest or greatest uh, shape deformation. Meanwhile, when L is e between zero and one, GS learns to compromise between the two extremes. Besides, we add a glyph loss to preserve the main text shape. Finally, we train a network GT to map the structure map back to the style image and use the style loss to enhance the texture details. So this is our overall framework. Now we show our experimental result. Compared with other methods, our network is able to transfer vivid shape and texture features and generate more visually appearing artistic test stylization results. Here is an example of our scale controllable style transfer results. We achieve continuous transformation showing a smooth growing process of the leaves. Here is another example of snowflakes. Our model can be also used for dynamic text generation. We can also combine different shape and texture styles to create some brand new styles, hmm. or extend our model to symbol and icon stylization. To conclude, we solve a new controllable artistic text st uh, stylization problem through our bidirectional shape matching framework, showing impressive results in several applications. Welcome to our poster to discuss more details. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Tai Chu from UTL Stain. So today I'm going to talk about understanding, whitening, and current transform, or WCT first style transfer. So the goal today is to use the concept of neural style transfer to understand why sound of WCTs can realize style transfer. So neural style transfer is actually the first paper discussing how to use neural networks for style transfer. And there were two key findings. The first one is the content of an image can be represented by a feature map from a high convolution layer in VGG19. The second one is the style of an image can be represented by a set of grand matrices of feature maps. Yeah, so to realize style transfer, we are actually solving an optimization problem where we are looking for an image I whose content representation is close to the red one and uh, whose, content represent, uh, whose style representation is close to the blue one. And solving this could be very slow. And later, uh, we have faster algorithm using WCT. Basically, it's just an autoencoder taking as input a content image and the style image, and the output is the stylized image. The only difference, the only difference is at the bottleneck, there's the WCT. And for better result, we just cascade more autoencoders. But the question is why this works. So let's look at the autoencoders. The encoder first extracts a content feature map and also a style feature map. And what we do with them first is to centralize them by subtracting their main column vectors. And then from the covariance of content feature maps, we can define a whitening matrix, WC, where UC is any kind of arbitrary uh, unitary matrix. So for example, if you use this identity matrix, it corresponds to ZCA whitening. All right, so similarly, uh, we can define another whitening matrix WS from the covariance of style feature maps. And the inverse of WS is the coloring matrix we want. So we can apply whitening matrix and coloring matrix to the centralized content feature map and then have it recenter. The final feature FWCT after being decoded is the stylized image we, we are wanted. So again, why this works? 
So from the perspective of newer style transfer, in this scenario, we are actually solving an optimization problem defined in red. However, instead of really solving this problem, we can show FWCT is already an approximate or suboptimal solution to it. So we just plug FWCT into the loss function, and we can show that the style loss is zero, the content loss is bounded, which means uh, style is well transferred and contents roughly preserved. And furthermore, in content loss, the blue term is the only one that is dependent on what kind of WCT we are using. So minimizing the content loss over WCTs is equivalent to maximizing the chase value of the blue term, for which we can have an upper bound. Yeah, so if ZCA is used right now, we can show the, um, the trace value is pretty close to the upper bound, which is good. However, if PCA is used, uh, we can show the trace value could even be negative, which is bad because we are maximizing the trace value. So um, the conclusion is WCT can transfer style well, but it does not guarantee the content will be well preserved. However, some WCTs like ZCA, uh, they can preserve content well. And we can confirm this conclusion from the experiment. So as you can see, some WCTs like ZCA in the first column can preserve content well. However, some WCTs like PCA in the second column, uh, the content is not well preserved. Yeah, so that's all for today. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> All the speakers, please come to the stage. Um, questions? If somebody has a question, please approach one of the mics or use the slido.com website, where the code is, again, ICCV2019 underscore D1. Yes, a question over there. Yeah, this is for the first paper. Did you try to control the background or see that it's disentangled from the face that it's generated? <coughs> uh, uh, that's a very good question. So, uh, no, we didn't try uh, to separate the background, but we are aware that there are some works which are trying to do that. But, yeah, we, we didn't try it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Maybe another question to um, to Im image to style again. Um, another question to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, from me. <laughs> if nobody's willing oh, okay. to ask, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, so you you use for this W plus vector like a simple concatenation of the 18 uh, layer vectors, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And for the style transfer, you use the first nine or something for yeah, the yeah, content. Yeah, sure. oh, yeah. But it sounds like you used a very simple uh, kind of variation of, of, of the original 512 vectors. Is there something um, more complicated that you can use to maybe achieve a more compact vector or adapt it better for a particular task? Uh, we probably can also embed uh, in W space, the original W space, uh, which makes it more compact. But then you cannot realize some other style trends. So like as we showed, W plus space is able to embed any image. So the style codes of those images can be then used for style transfer. So if you simplify the uh, space itself, so its uh, expressibility actually decreases. So W space turns out to be a better space in that. And maybe learn function that would be yeah. not, neither of both, but yeah, something yeah, yeah. else. That, that can also be done, I think so, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, I'll ask maybe another question. The whitening paper? Um, yeah. Uh, you. So can you use your bound, this trace of WS and WC, as um, quality assessment for how well a particular style image would match a particular content image? Like, you have several styles. Which one of them? would best match a particular content uh, image? Yes, so my answer to your question is I don't know. So what I can do for you is if you give me a formulation of WCT, I can compute the performance for you. But if you want to ask me 
which one is the best, I, I really don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Um, any questions from the crowd? I can ask more. Um, for the text paper, um, most of your textures were rather homogeneous, like leaves and um, water. What if you have a more kind of directional texture, like long hair or wood that has a orient particular orientation? Can you use the orientation to maybe like follow the text lines or uh, additional yeah. control levels, basically? Uh, yes, process. in our supplementary materials, we show some examples on the uh, sketchy hair and uh, the wood, uh, and the result is quite good. So <laughs> you can uh, find our uh, supplementary on the internet. Okay, cool. Okay, let's thank the speakers again. Okay, uh, let's work on our next speaker. Uh, we will present the learning implicit generating models by matching uh, perceptual features. Hey, good morning. Uh, I'm Inkit and talk about our work on how we can train an implicit generative model for images with help of features from free trained networks. I'll take you through the motivation behind the work, uh, dive into the details of our network, and show some of the quantitative and qualitative results. Deep convolution neural networks pre-trained with ImageNet perform really well on various tasks like object detection and style transfer. Perceptual features are the features from these pre-trained networks that are rich in information. We train generative models by matching perceptual features from these networks. When we do so, we completely avoid using adversarial training and thus drive away from the complexity of mean-max game. We call this network Generative Feature Matching Network, GFMN. In GFMN, instead of a discriminator, we use feature extractors. Our feature extractors are various pre-trained connets that are fixed during the training of GFMN. These pre-trained networks for feature extractors are either autoencoders or cross-domain classifiers. Using pre-trained networks, we match the statistics of various layers for real and generated images. GFMN has two main components, a generator and a feature extractor. During training, we sample noise vector from a normal distribution and run it through the generator. These generated images are then passed to a fixed feature extractor to get feature statistics. The L2 loss is computed with mean and covariances between generated image features and real training data features. We pre-compute the mean and covariance feature statistics of the training images before the start of the training. You would notice that for a good estimate, one would need to sample a very large batch, which isn't quite feasible. In order to overcome this, we use a moving average of differences of feature means and feature covariances. To make it even more stable, we update the moving averages using ADAM, which has better adaptive learning of first and second order moment. This is how GFMN fits into the family. MMD GAN involves learning a Gaussian kernel function, and it converges because kernel is universal. While in GFMN, the kernel is established on a fixed feature map and also converges as the feature map is universal. However, MMD GAN has complexity of mean max optimization, while in GFMN, we simply optimize the MMD distance. We benchmark our results for CIFAR 10 and STL 10 datasets. In comparison with MMD GAN, our model achieves much better inception score, while in comparison with other state-of-the-art GANs, we achieve better or comparable performance in both inception score and FID. Our best performing model has feature extractors from both VGG 19 and ResNet 18 and a ResNet-like generator. Here are some of the results with different feature extractors. In the first two rows, the feature extractor used are from a pre-trained autoencoders, whereas the rest are from a pre-trained ImageNet classifiers. For CIFAR 10, we get the best results when we use VGG19 and ResNet18 features and a generator that uses residual connections.
We also investigate the impact of the number of features. The table shows inception and FID score for CIFAR 10 dataset when we use features from different number of layers. For the first two rows, features from only the bottom most layers were extracted, whereas for the last row, features from 16 layers were used. It is apparent that the more feature we use, the better the results we get. In conclusion, for all the different data set that we experimented with, we did not observe any mode collapse when we use add a moving average. The loss during the training is correlated with the quality of the generated images. Training with add a moving average leads to better quality of images in comparison with regular moving average. It also allows us to have a better and stable estimates with smaller mini batches. We have open sourced our code and have a blog post too. You can find the shortened URL in this link, in this slide. Please catch me during the poster session if you have any feedback and want to know more about the work. Thank you. Uh, just a reminder, you can ask questions on Slido, S-L-I dot D-O. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jolin from Adobe Research. Today, I'm going to present our work on freeform imaging painting with gated convolution. So let me give, first give a quick background on imaging painting. Imaging painting is a task to synthesize alternative contents in the missing regions in the image to make the results visually realistic and semantically correct. For example, given this input image shown on the left, we want to first mask out the distracting watermark region in the middle and then use it, use it as input to, we can generate the, this nice result shown on the right. So as we can see, image painting can help us to remove a distracting object, but also can allow user to um, do creative image editing by retouching the photos. However, there are several limitations on existing image painting methods. First, they are often uh, trained on rectangular or unrealistically designed holes. Second, they usually don't support the additional user guidance channels like a Sketch, which can be used to customize in painting results. For example, the existing state-of-the-art method um, called the contextual attention model, which works well on the rectangular shaped holes, but it often fails with artifact on freeform shaped holes as shown on the right. So now let's first look at our motivation in more detail. So standard and naive convolutions treat all input pixels in the image as valid ones. As you can see here, uh, in convolutions, we all, always apply same operation across the whole image. But you can notice that in the, in the missing region, they are uh, fake pixels. It's invalid pixels. This makes uh, the convolution operation inevitably create artifact um, inconsistent predictions inside the holes with respect to the pixels surrounding the hole. So there exists a method called partial, co partial conv, try to address this problem by binary uh, masking technique. Um, for example, as shown here, um, on the left side, it's an architecture for bi partial conv, which uses a, a, a hard gating mechanism to try to use a rule-based propagation of binary masks. In contrast, uh, in this paper, we propose a new architecture called gated convolution, which tried to automatically learn a dynamic gating mechanism uh, and use uh, um, the, the, the predicted mask to do prediction. Our second idea is on the discriminator side. So instead of applying single GAN on the, on the whole image, we apply this uh, spectral normalized GAN discriminator on every single patches to reduce the artifact. Our third idea is about adding a uh, user-guided extension to the impending system. In addition to this uh, specified missing regions in the image, uh, we can always optionally allow the users to draw the sketch to, to make the impending result follow the user input. So for example, in this picture, uh, this uh, beautiful picture of ARC, um, user can draw this uh, uh, heart-shaped sketch in the middle. We can generate a result as shown on the right. 
So in our experiments, so we quantitatively compare our method with the uh, state-of-the-art method in terms of um, L1 and L2 errors. And as you can see from the table, our method achieved better results. And especially on the free from mask cases, our improvement is larger. So here we show some sample results on the qualitative visual comparisons. And from left to right, we show origin image, input, global local method, and uh, contextual attention, partial comp, and our proposed method. As you can see, our method generates more visually pleasing results. So we also trained the separate model for faces, and also, again, uh, we observe a better result on, on the visual quality and uh, also the content evaluation. Here are some uh, sample results for our uh, third idea on the user-guided extension. As you can see on the holes with a sketch, our results are outperforming existing methods. So we released our code, pre-trained models, and interactive demo all in this site. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks for the uh, impending introduction by Dr. Jolene. It makes my presentation more easier to understand. And this is my uh, paper titled Finite Compatible and Diverse Fashion Image in Painting. This is joint work between Malone Technology and the University of Maryland College Park. So let us imagine that a lady wants someone to recommend a top clothing item that looks good on her. In this paper, unlike traditional recommendation systems retrieving existing items, we formulate this problem as image in painting. We mask out the top clothing region and design an algorithm to generate tops. However, this problem is very challenging as it is a multi-model problem. Tops with very different shapes, for example, long sleeves, short sleeves, or tanks, could, be, uh, could be match the other existing garments. And for each shape, different shapes, different appearances with diverse colors and textures may be expected. Thus, we argue that there are two key properties when tackling this problem. One is compatibility, that the generated clothing should match the style of existing garments. And the other is diversity, multiple results should be generated. And as shown, these two properties are reflected both in shape and appearance. To this end, we design a two-stage framework that sequentially generates shapes and appearances. The shape-generated network first fills a missing segmentation map, and the appearance-generated network uses the imprinted segmentation map for generating color and texture. Both stages have a compatibility module that allows compatible and diverse generation. Let us first look at the shape generation network. The generator is based on an image-to-image -image translation network, which takes person representation like pose to complete the segmentic layout. To enable diversity, a variational unit structure is used where a shape encoder encodes the ground truth shape to a latent code, whose KL divergence with respect to a standard normal distribution is minimized. However, this fails, to this fails to consider virtual compatibility information. Thus, we further encode the existing fashion atoms by fading these clothing segments into a compatibility shape encoder to explicitly condition the generation on the co-occurred garments. This is based on a popular assumption in fashion compatibility modeling that fashion atoms usually worn together are compatible. Thus, the contextual garments contain very valuable compatibility information regarding the missing atom. As shown in this slide, contextual garments have a lady's skirt. Thus, the network will more likely to generate a woman's top rather than a man's suit. As for the appearance generation network, it has a very similar architecture. It uses the generated layout in the last step as guidance for imprinting the missing regions. The contextual garments are again encoded to inject the compatibility information in the generator. During test time, we first, we first delete the pixels in the region of interests, then the shape, in, the shape generation network can generate a diverse set of layouts, like long pants and shorts. Then different appearances can be generated, as shown here, like dark jeans and light jeans. 
The second example generates truth. And in the last example, we can see our method is also able to generate something that, is not that does not exist in the original picture, like the different hats. And the generated clothing are pretty compatible with the existing atoms, both in shape and appearance. Due to the reconstruction nature of autoencoders, by simple modification, our network can also be used for virtual try-on applications. We can disable the compatibility encoder and directly sample from the uh, from a Gaussian uh, from directly sample from the shape and appearance encoder. As a result, the network will try to reconstruct the input and produce virtual try-on result. Like in this picture, if we fit a blue top on the uh, if we fit a blue top as the input, the targeted person will wear blue top. Here are two more examples. Where in the first example we transfer skirt. And in the next example, we transfer a pair of jeans. We believe our method can benefit a lot of fashion-related tasks, like compatibility-aware fashion recommendation and design, as well as clothing transfer. Thank you. Please visit our poster for more detail. Please, all the speakers. Uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, if not, I will ask, uh, there are two questions. Oh. One. Hello, uh, I wanted to ask a question about gated convolution. I'm, <coughs> I'm currently aware that about that deformable convolution has a somewhat similar attribute in that it has also has learned uh, deformations that allow the convolutional kernel to have uh, varying shape. How exactly are those two different? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. yeah, so for gated convolution, it's um, it's kind of more some kind of element-wise attention. So uh, it doesn't change your predicted spatial mask. Um, it basically have a gate for each pixel in each channel, um, 3D block uh, the feature map, and it will apply element-wise um, gating on each feature. Yeah. So. There's no yeah adapt spatial adaptation like you know like that so yeah. thank you yeah. okay I'm gonna ask a question from Slido. Uh so it's for the uh, the feature matching paper uh, the question is what is the key architectural difference uh, compared to generative moment matching networks uh, moving estimate instead of uh, Another question is moving estimates instead of uh, batch estimates. Uh, it's, it's because uh, when we use, because we cannot accommodate, in order to have a good estimate, you need a huge large batch size, right? And you cannot do it with a smaller batch size, and which, I mean, you do have a GPU uh, limitations and things like that. So the better estimate would be have to have a moving estimate. And this is why we use a adder moving average instead of a regular moving average. We do have some experiments which shows that this performs better in terms of both qualitative and quantitative results as well in the paper. Uh, I mean, the question, uh, I mean, that's also a question on the key architectural difference compared to a uh, moment mentioned network. I, I see. The architectural difference, uh, we, we did not, in order to have a good comparison, we did not have a main differences in the architecture. We use, res, in the generator, we use the ResNet architecture, and there isn't key, many much changes there. It's just how we, uh, how we do, uh, so now in here we do have a fixed feature map in compared to how we we learned in in all the other methods we learned the on uh, we learned the kernel uh, the the feature map the kernel uh, kernel is learned in the other method here we we learn the kernel on a fixed feature map which is coming from a feature extractor that's the main difference in here I see okay thanks uh, there's also one question from Saito for the free phone in pending. Uh, the question is, uh, why use L1 and L2 error to evaluate model? Why doesn't use more advanced uh, metrics? Um, yeah, because um, uh, for the for the image in painting task, um, so typically it's different from um, object generation or noise generated image. Um, it, there's a strong constraint in the contextual region, so 
Um, although there are a lot of ambiguities in the impending results, but uh, uh, overall, you know, uh, the L1 or L2 metric can still give a rough idea, you know, uh, where the, this algorithm stands there. So, but in terms of visual quality, definitely you need to do user study and yeah. So, yeah. Uh, okay, due to count, uh, time constraint, let's thank all the speakers again. Hi everyone, my name is Asaf Shoher, and in this talk I will explain how a GAN can be trained on a single image. We call it an internal GAN, or INGAN for short, and this is joint work with Shai Bagon, Philip Isola, and Michal Irani. So what do I mean by internal GAN? Well, let's first see how it differs from a regular one. So a classic GAN trains on this huge collection of images. It is then able to generate new images from the same image distribution. In contrast, an internal GAN trains on a single image. How is this possible? Well, a single image is a huge collection of patches. In fact, each image contains hundreds of thousands of them. InGAN learns the distribution of these patches at multiple scales and is then able to generate new images of different shapes but with the same patch distribution. For example, look at this larger generated image. Ingen added more windows to, to the house, but all have the same size and aspect ratio as the original windows. Similarly, we can generate a smaller image, a visual summary. This time Ingen stripped of windows and rows of windows, but locally, each piece of that image looks as if it came from the original input image. It can also generate images of different aspect ratios, but note that the aspect ratio of elements inside the image has not changed. So how do we go about doing this? Giving an input image and a geometric transformation, InGAN transforms the image accordingly. It trains for various transformations and generates images of different sizes and aspect ratios. Initially, they don't look as good as this, but they are then fed into a discriminator, which trains to distinguish between patches from the original image and those of the generated one. So the generator's job is to fool the discriminator to believe that the patches it sees actually belong to the original image. The discriminator produces this map showing which patches it believes came from the original image and which from the generated one. However, GANs are known to suffer from mode collapse. For example, what if we generated an image containing only grass? The discriminator would have been happy with it since all of these patches can be found in the original image. To avoid this problem and make sure that the generated image contains all the patches, we apply the generator again, but this time using the inverse transformation. The generator should be able to reconstruct the original image from the generated one. This guarantees no information is lost. Finally, the overall loss of in-GAN is the GAN loss along with the reconstruction loss to prevent mode collapse. Okay, so let's see some results. Here's an input image. Once trained, InGAN can retarget this image to any size, shape, or aspect ratio in real time. In particular, this allows producing such smoothly transforming videos. Note that the size of the fruit is not changing. Instead, InGAN adds and removes fruits and boxes or this uh, line of watermelons there. The transformation can be any invertible transformation. For example, an affine transformation or a general homography. Note that despite the distorted shape of the image, the elements inside the image are not distorted. In this example, Ingen adds windows and floors to the building. And here it adds and removes columns to the temple and note how the penguins don't get any fatter. Instead, Ingen just gives birth to new penguins. <laughs> Here you can see Ingen adds more soldiers or terraces and farmers in the rice field. But nobody's perfect. <laughs> Ingen has no notion of uh, semantics or context. It knows nothing about objects or scenes. It simply just preserves the patch distribution. So Ingen handles this wide variety of data types ranging from simple textures to complex natural images. It synthesizes sing single texture images 
and multi-texture images, through texture-rich paintings and art, and all the way to natural images. So in conclusion, it is possible to train again on a single natural image. Moreover, the patch distribution captures what we refer to as the DNA of the image. This allows replicating it and generating more images of the same type. So to learn more, please visit us at poster number seven, and thank you all for listening. Hey there, I'm David Bao. I'm going to talk about seeing what a GAN cannot generate. So to get a feel for this problem, I've mixed up some GAN generated images with some real images. And on this huge screen here, I want you to take a look and see if you can tell which ones are which. Do you think I put the real images on the top or on the bottom? So actually, the real images are on the bottom here. And for all of us who work with GANs, maybe we can tell the difference because we've gotten attuned to recognizing what kinds of things a GAN inserts in terms of artifacts and uh, things that the GAN has trouble generating. Now typically we quantify this by putting the real and fake images through an inception network and comparing the statistics between the two distributions. We summarize that as a single number we call FID. Here FID is 18, which is great, right? But this always leaves us with a question, which is what does that actually mean? What's actually missing between the distributions? What is the GAN not able to generate overall? And if we look at example images that a GAN can generate, it also leaves us with this question, what is missing in these individual images? I mean, they show us examples of what the GAN can generate, but they're, they're not showing us what the GAN is skipping. So that's the topic of this paper. To understand a distribution, what we do is this. We just take a real image and we segment it. We count up the pixels of trees and buildings and grass and sky, and we summarize this over the distribution. So I've drawn this as a histogram on a logarithmic scale here which you can see uh, shows us a catalog of what we expect to see in the training distribution. And then we do that in the same thing for the uh, GAN generated images, which I'll draw here with a red line. And you can see where it deviates shows us specific things that the GAN is not generating enough of. For example, on a linear scale, you can see that there's 60% fewer person pixels in the GAN generated images than there are in real images. And cars and fences, palm trees, signs with text, these things are all underrepresented by the GAN. And, uh, and so that leads us to this question, which is, what does that actually mean? What does this look like in a real image? Let's take a look at an example um, hotel room. And so this hotel room is a pretty, pretty reasonable example. It's got a good looking bed, a uh, nice, uh, nice view here, and some furniture in the room. But it's actually a minimal room that was generated by the GAN that's missing lots of stuff. It's hard to see what's missing until we upgrade to a real hotel room. And we can see, oh, actually, we should have a TV set, maybe a lamp. Uh, our windows should probably have curtains and things like that. And so the, the point I'm making is that looking at just GAN-generated images, it's hard to see what's missing until we pair them up with real training images. And so the pairs reveal omissions. To make these pairs pretty simple, you start with a training image and you put it through the inverse of the GAN. You recover a latent that can generate the image. But that's tricky if the GAN is very deep. And so in our paper, we, dis we discussed how to invert a GAN that's deep. Um, it's a two-step process. First, you train an encoder. And the trick is to, in to train it by layer, uh, which helps you deal with the depth. And then the second step is you refine the initial guess of the latent that you get by putting it through an optimization process. And you can also do this by layer. Uh, when you apply the technique, the method works really well. You can actually reconstruct pretty much every pixel of any generated image from, uh, from a state-of-the-art GAN. Um, and that gives us a powerful tool, because if we take an arbitrary image and it cannot be reconstructed, then we know that the GAN actually cannot generate the image. And not only that, but we get a picture of the things that the GAN is having trouble with. So for example, like this, this, uh, this lady here is standing in front of um, is a person uh, with, with, with all sorts of things in the image. If we ask the GAN to regenerate it, you can see it has no trouble with the grass, the building, and the trees, but the person is totally gone. So let's take a look at this example here. Um, we've got a nice bride and groom. How does the GAN summarize this? All right. And um, so 
Now the other th classes that we saw in the statistics that were dropped out, we can also verify them by looking at the um, example images. Here we have a lot of examples of vehicles being dropped out of images. And, um, and the thing I want to point out here is that, um, that the GAN does a reasonable job at in-painting uh, when it generates its images. It doesn't just distort the images, but actually makes pretty, pretty plausible looking results. Um, and um, uh, this is something that generalizes across different, uh, different classes and models. And so the takeaway message is, we shouldn't just study what GANs can generate, but it's just as interesting and important to look at the inverse problem of looking at what GANs omit and what they cannot generate. So to talk about more of the details, come to the poster. Uh, we're gonna be here at number eight right after the talk. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, I'm Che Huberlin from National Tsinghua University in Taiwan. I'm going to introduce our paper, Coco Gan Generation by Parts via Conditional Coordinating. This is also a joint work with National Taiwan University and Google Research. In recent years, generative model has accomplished many astonishing progresses. However, it becomes more and more difficult to train this state-of-the-art generative models. Recent research keeps adding more parameters and larger batch sizes to achieve high-quality and high-resolution generation. These designs force us to acquire terabyte-level memory, which is not affordable for regular users. But an interesting observation is humans do not necessarily process the full image at once. We learn to recognize and to create things with our limited eye view. With this intuition, we build Google Gang, which generates and discriminates part of the image. You may also view Google Gang as a self-supervised framework that learns the coordinate of the images. We show that Google Gang can synthesize visually compelling images, reduce training memory by 50%, and we demonstrate three interesting applications. Kogogen inhabits most of the standard GAN components. On the top left, we first sample a Latin variable in green and duplicate it multiple times and concatenate with the coordinate condition in blue. Then a patch generator synthesizes a smaller patch for each pair of Latin variable and coordinate condition. On the discriminator side, we directly concatenate multiple small patches together to form a larger patch. The discriminator learns to discriminate this larger patch and notice that the full images are never generated during training. At testing, again, we sample a Latin variable, duplicate it multiple times, and contain it with the coordinate. Then the patch generator synthesizes all the native patches, then we concatenate all the small patches together to form the final full image. We do not add any post-processing after the concatenation. Here we show some generation results on celebrity dataset and Elson bedroom category. On the left hand side are the generated patches and on the right hand side are the generated full images. Notice that the full images are visually seamless and of high quality. Then we try to do something crazier. We train the generator to synthesize even smaller patches down to four by four pixels. And yes, those small patches on the left hand side are the generated patches. Although with some quality degradation, the four images are still globally coherent and of high quality. Here we show the classical Latin space interpolation experiment. We want to highlight that this is difficult for Kogan since all the small patches must change synchronously to avoid creating any, any discontinuity between patches. We also report the FID, which shows that Kogan is compatible with the prior state of the art in terms of quality and diversity. The first application to show is the beyond boundary generation. By extrapolating the coordinate system, Kogan can synthesize larger field of view images that are not existing in the training data. All the synthesized samples are guaranteed to be novel samples. The second application to show is patch-guided generation. Imagine a scenario that the full image is corrupted into a patch. We can train the discriminator to estimate the Latin variable of the patch and use the generator to synthesize the full image. 
The final full image will be locally similar to the given patch and globally coherent. Notice that the baseline, the partial convolution as a baseline does not work well in this scenario. The third application to show is the panorama generation. By switching the coordinate system to a cylindrical coordinate system, Kuogen can natively synthesize horizontally cyclic panoramas. In summary, Kuogen is the conditional coordinate framework that can synthesize visually compelling images without using the full image during training. Our code is on GitHub, and see you at poster number nine, and I'm looking for a PhD. Thank you. Speakers, yeah. So, uh, questions from the audience. So, I have a question about what uh, Gun cannot do. So, now that you know that uh, what Gun cannot do, can you make the gun better? That now it will do it. Oh, that to is, close that is, the loop. That, that's 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 a good question, and we we didn't address it in our paper, but I think it's a it's a natural. Uh, avenue for future research, and it's clearly the, the, the question to ask, one of the questions to ask next, so. So another question? Yeah, so uh, two questions. The first is for Ingan. Uh, very nice paper. What's the training time for an image, and what resolution do you work on? So the training time varies. It depends on how texture like the images, so it can be as about one hour and the, the longest time would be four hours. And the res we can work in any resolution, it's a fully convolutional system, and uh, most of the examples shown here today are about resolution of uh, uh, 256 on 256. Okay, thank you. And uh, for the second paper, and this is actually more related to the talk you gave on Monday, uh, when you showed that you can turn off some of the uh, some of the neurons mm -hmm. and uh, trees, for example, uh, are disappear. So, do you think that could be the same case, or did you try for faces that certain neurons can control certain parts of the face? Right, and also related to this paper. So, if you uh, if if you do um, some of these methods on uh, on faces, you see some of the same effects. Uh, one of the reasons that um, uh, we, treat, uh, we, we look at scenes, it's because it's easier to quantify the effects in scenes. So in scenes, we have lots of natural uh, hierarchical structure uh, uh, in the form of just object classes that a scene is made up of, whereas a, a face has relatively little structure. So if things drop out, like earrings or certain hairstyles or things like that, it can be qu hard to quantify uh, how, how these, how these uh, sort of hard to label things uh, are affected using these techniques. Okay, thank you. To, to the third speaker, so yeah, seems like the each coordinate is independently generated. How they can be uh, get a dependency between different coordinates? Um, actually, the Latin space, the Latin vector is shared, so the generator has an idea which what features to generate that can um, share among different patches. And you can also view Kogan as a standard again with a co with the coordinate as a query to query which patch to generate. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think there's one more question from the side side. Uh, it's for David. Uh, why do you think Gen misses these modes of hard objects? Um, so, so the hi the hypothesis that we have from just looking at the types of objects that are dropped is that they seem to be the things that might be computationally more expensive. So, um, so you know, the GAN is not dropping the smallest objects or the rarest ones. Some of the more common ones are also dropped. Uh, so it's not just something, it's, about, it's not just about things that are missing from the data set. So, the, so my guess, our hypothesis is that these are things that are computationally expensive for the GAN to model, and the GAN's just being lazy. Yep. Okay, uh, let's send all the speakers again. Good morning. My name is Hang Chu from the University of Toronto. I'm presenting neural turtle graphics for modeling city road layouts. This work was done during an internship at the NVIDIA Toronto AI Lab. 
joined with Daqing, David, Amlan, Maria, Xinkai, Mingyu, Antonio, and Sonia. Synthetic pumps are important in many applications. For example, testing self-driving cars and deliver drones in a simulator, city planning, movie visual effects, and gaming applications. In current simulators, the environments are typically small, a simple and small scale. It is hard, difficult to scale up with manual creation or traditional procedural modeling algorithms. This is because neither of them captures the diversity and realisticness of real-world cities at the global scale. On the other hand, spatial graphs are ubiquitous in computer vision, from topological graphs in medical and shape analysis to social graphs of group activities to 2D and 3D scene graphs. So here, we propose neural turtle graphics, which we use in generating cities conditioned on city name, <coughs> interactive generation, where users provide sketches of road shape primitives, as well as applying the generative prior to better parse road from aerial images. We are interested in roads because they are large-scale spatial graphs where control points and roads form the nodes and edges. And therefore, neural turtle graphics is a deep generative model for spatial graphs. We formulate graph generation as an iterative process. With a queue of node, we pop an active node, expand the graph locally, and then push nodes back to the queue and repeat this process. Here we take a closer look at one iteration, where, with the active node being selected. <coughs> We randomly sample non-overlapping incoming passes leading towards the active node and encode their shapes with the encoder neural network. A decoder produces outgoing nodes based on the encoded information where loops are produced by simply checking spatial proximity. We repeat this process until graph generation completes. Let's now take a look at the experiments and results. We train our model using RoadNet, parts from OpenStreetMaps, as well as the publicly available SpaceNet dataset. Here, we show the iterative generation process using our NTG model. It can be seen that our model captures the unique layout style of different cities. Qualitatively, we show that our NDG model does not suffer from poor locality in graph RNN, overfitting and mode collapse in GANs, as well as sim oversimplicity in the classical L system algorithms. Our model is capable of creating novel cities that never exist in the training data while intertwining piecewise memorizations. Quantitatively, we show that our model outperforms the comparisons in both perceptual and urban planning metrics. Our model enables interactive generation of road layout, for example, generating an imaginary city that is half New York and half Berlin. We combine our graph generative prior with CNNs to parse road from satellite images, achieving a new state-of-the-art result in the SpaceNet dataset. Finally, we showcase a new application that converts a satellite image to simulation-ready synthetic environments. First, we parse road from the satellite image and use our trained NTG model to expand the road layout based on the existing style. This produces infinite amount of virtual environments that can be used to train and improve autonomous agents. Welcome to our poster session and check out our project page. Thank you for listening. So hi, I'm Michael Oechsle from the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems and the company ETAS. 
I'm excited to present our project on texture fields. In recent years, learning-based methods have shown remarkable results on reconstructing 3D shapes. However, 3D objects do not only consist of geometry. Much less attention was spent on reconstructing the appearance of objects, even though texture, for example, is a characteristic property of an object. In this work, our goal is a method that can reconstruct texture from a single image and a corresponding 3D shape, as well as a generative model for novel textures. One of the major limiting factors of existing methods result from the representation of the texture. When using colored voxels as representation, deep learning, deep learning architectures are feasible on the 3D grid using 3D convolutions. However, due to high memory costs, methods are limited to low resolution discretization and hence also to low frequency texture. In contrast, texture atlases can represent high frequency texture. However, these are limited to predefined template models using UV mappings. Moreover, texture atlases are prone to discontinuities of texture. To solve these limiting factors, we propose a novel texture representation. Our representation is independent of shape discretization, therefore it allows for representing texture at arbitrary resolution. Furthermore, this method does not require template model and it's independent of shape representation, so it can be applied to any 3D model. Inspired by recently published continuous representation of 3D shapes, our novel texture representation is based on regressing color values in the 3D space. So we represent the texture by learning a continuous field parametrized with a neural network. This network maps any 3D location to a color value in the RGB space. By evaluating the texture field at any location on the shape, we can extract texture for the shape or for image pixels using corresponding depth and camera information. For reconstructing texture, we condition the texture field on a feature embedding of a 3D shape as well as the feature embedding of a condition, for example, an, Im an image. The texture field then learns to predict color values following the provided conditions for given locations. We applied the con Furthermore, we used our novel representation for a generative model. Our setup here consists of a variational outer encoder with the texture as the decoder. At inference, we can sample novel textures for a given 3D object. We applied the conditional model for single view texture reconstruction. The model is trained in a supervised fashion on single categories of the shape net data set. Our model is able to reconstruct plausible textures from a single image for the corresponding shape. Here we compared our method to a novel view synthesis baseline that uses a simple unit architecture. In contrast to the baseline, our model inherently fulfills 3D consistency. While trained on synthetic input images, our method generalizes reasonably well to real input images. We combined our method with the shape reconstruction method occupancy networks and built a full pipeline for 3D reconstruction of shape and texture. Our generative model is also trained on ShapeNet data. Here are some interpolations in the latent space. For all three models, the texture is generated from the same latent code. This generative setup can also be used for transferring texture from one model to another. To conclude, we introduced a novel continuous representation for texture of 3D objects. If you want to know more about texture fields, please visit us at our poster. Thanks for your attention.
Hello everyone, I'm Guan Daoyang. Today I will present our work Point Flow. Um, this is a joint work with Xun Huang, Zhe Kun Hao, Ming Yu Liu, Serge Belongji, and Barack Harry Haran. Xun and I contribute equally in this project. Point Cloud is a very popular 3D representation with a very desirable property. They are compact and easy to manipulate. They are output of many hardware de devices, and they can be a stepping stone to more sophisticated representations such as meshes. So it's interesting to understand the distribution of point clouds. Our work will focus on the task of point cloud generation. Specifically, what we want to do is to train a model whose input is a random vector and the output is a point cloud. The key insight is that each of the 3D shape can be viewed as a distribution of 3D points. Points far away from the surface will have low density, so they are less likely to be sampled. And points near the surface will have high density, so they are more likely to be sampled. Since a shape can, is a distribution of 3D points, so we can view a point cloud as a sample of the such distribution. For example, the airplane in the slide defines a distribution in the 3D space, and if we sample multiple points from the distribution, we can generate a point cloud for this airplane. Now the question is, how do we model the distribution of such 3D points? One way to tackle it is to learn a network that transforms points sampled from a, a prior, such as a Gaussian, into the points that's near the surface of the shape. Ideally, what we want to do is to have a model that learns a continual transformation that can smoothly transform these 3D points. So therefore, we come to a model uh, called continuous normalizing flow, or CNFs, as introduced in the neural ODE paper. A CNF transform points by moving them along the learned vector field in the space. So the output of the CNF is a solution to an initial value problem. So formally, let Y defines the points in the prior space. Then the output of the CNF can be obtained by integrating along the vector field G theta. And G theta is a parameterized by a deep neural network. A nice property about CNF is that they are invertible. And the inverse of the CNF is obtained by simply flipping the integration direction. Thanks to the fact that CNFs are invertible, then we can use the change of variable formula um, to compute the exact likelihood of the output points x. This allows us to train CNFs with maximum likelihood training. Here's a visualization of a CNF transforming 3D points between a Gaussian and the airplane. We call such CNF a point CNF. Notice right now each point CNF can only trans uh, generate point clouds for one specific shape. So to extend the model to generate point cloud for multiple shapes, what, what we need to do is to first learn a latent space of shapes and then we can update the point CNF to generate point cloud conditional on the vector sample from this latent space. So how do we learn the distribution of the shape latent space? Well, we, so we propose to use another CNF, the latent CNF, that transform a Gaussian vector into a latent vector in the space. Then the whole generating process of a novel point cloud will go as the following. So first, we sample a Gaussian vector and transform such vector into a latent vector in, the, uh, in that space. And then we sample another Gaussian uh, point cloud and use the point CNF to transform it into point clouds on the surface of the shape. This two CNF constitute the whole model of point flow. Here are some qualitative results for autoencoding. Our model can faithfully reconstruct the input uh, shapes, which is shown in the left columns. So here are some results for point cloud generations. Point flow is able to generate both diverse and realistic point clouds. And finally, here's more visualization of the point transformation learned by the point CNF. Thank you so much for listening. Our code and data are released online. Welcome to our poster if you are interested to learn more. Thank you.
guess, question, please. A uh, question for uh, paper two, uh, texture uh, representation. Have you ever uh, tried some uh, uh, non-rigid objects, for example, human body with some deformable projector? How about your method? So, so we haven't tried. We have just used um, seven categories of the ShapeNet data set for learning uh, the texture representation. The representation itself, so you, you have maybe seen the cats uh, in the presentation and the cat is represented, but we, we haven't done uh, this single image uh, texture reconstruction task on any other objects as the uh, ShapeNet data set. Yeah. Yes or no, for uh, non-rigid object tag, uh, text representation with this approach? Yeah, we, we haven't tried, so. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Okay, I can ask one question, the neural turtle graphics. Um, so your presentation is inherently 1D, right? But you're trying to capture 2D phenomena. Um, how well does it do for kind of more global 2D uh, properties like symmetry or closing roundabouts or like uh, uh, and can you combine it with maybe a 2D CNN to capture more global properties? Uh, so right now our representation is 2D uh, because we are separately predicting. Approach the mic, yeah. Sorry. So thanks for the great question. So our representation is actually 2D. We are predicting the delta X and delta Y separately. And uh, yes, we are able to capture the 2D structures. Or because of that formulation. Mm -hmm. Can you, maybe another question, can you capture or handle other types of data like sketches or fonts or architectural yes. graphics? Yes, that's also a great question. We actually experimented with uh, uh, sketch classification uh, in our supplemental material. So um, we're looking to expand this to other types of tasks as well. Other questions from the floor? If not, uh, for point flow. So basically you have uh, one nice property of point flow is that you have this kind of nice correspondence between particles in the Gaussian distribution and your, your data distribution. Can you use it to establish correspondences between different shapes, like different chairs? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. We've thought about it. Um, so I guess the current correspondence mainly rely on the location prior. So uh, um, we, can, we can see some of the basic correspondence, such as airplanes of one air, uh, the wind of the airplane corresponding to the wind of the other. But the main reason that we get that is because we train everything in the canonical for shape. But I think that in the future, uh, as a future work, uh, it's perfectly possible if we can align an object into a canonical shape and then go in through the point flow. Cool. Yeah. Thank Let's thank again all the speakers. All right. Uh, hi, my name is Amlan, and I'm here to present uh, Medicine, which is work from our NVIDIA Toronto AI lab. So modern computer vision pipelines involve a cycle of data collection, labeling, training, and deployment. And once this cycle is in place, labeling quickly becomes a big bottleneck. So this task of going from images to labels is a very important problem. And we believe for this problem, simulation is the key. With the advances we've made in simulation, we can actually use graphics to generate data and their labels for free. All right, so we asked the graphics phase how to do this. And they told us that we can actually write procedures to do this. And one of the ways to do this is to write probabilistic grammars. You can sample from a probabilistic grammar a scene graph, where each node of the scene graph represents an object, which is a class. And it also has some parameters, such as the location and the 3D asset of the object. Sampling is done one by one, and attributes are given to each object. And then we can render that using a graphics engine. The issue here, though, is that getting the parameters right is really hard. And you can get the parameters for the US, but it's not going to be the same for India. So naturally, the question that we asked here 
was could we learn these parameters from data to actually generate proper scene graphs? So let's look at the problem statement now in a little more detail. So we're given a target data set that's almost completely unlabeled, and we have this parametric simulator, which in this case is the probabilistic grammar. And the goal here is to generate a synthetic data set which first is similar in distribution to some target data set, and it maximizes the performance of some downstream model. And this is a very challenging problem because first we need to learn through a simulator, second, it uses rendering, which is non-differentiable, and we need to learn with the downstream model in the loop. So in a nutshell, this problem is basically to parameterize data and learn the right parameter distributions. And this is very similar to neural architecture search, where we parameterize architecture and learn the right parameter distributions. And therefore, we also like to call our problem neural data search. OK, so let's look at the algorithm and how we learn it. So given the probabilistic grammar, we sample a scene graph with the prior attributes and prior structure. Then we pass it through a graph neural network to generate a new scene graph with the same structure and new attributes for every object. This is passed to a renderer, which is a graphics engine, to generate training data. It's used by a downstream model to train for detection, segmentation, etc. To train this, we have two objectives. First, we'd like to match the distribution of the generated and synthetic data. So we pass both of these through a pre-trained feature extractor and optimize the MMD metric, which we heard about in one of the previous talks. The second goal of this is to maximize the task performance. For this, we actually generate a set of data. We train a model evaluated on a small subset of real data, and the performance generated is used as a reward, and we use gradient estimators using deep reinforcement learning to train the generator, much like neural architecture search. So training with this objective is actually a very tough problem because the renderer is non-differentiable, and we here use numerical gradients to backprop from the images back to the scene graph. Okay, now let's look at some results. So we experiment on the Kitty data set where the goal is, given Kitty images, can we generate optimized synthetic data trained for car detection performance? So the metric is actually the car detection performance that is trained in the downstream task model. And we compare against generating using just the probabilistic grammar and the data that's learned by medicine. And the probabilistic grammar comes from SDR, which is a paper by Prakash et al. from ICRA. So we optimized the simulator sequentially and observed improvements in performance, getting at the end about a 4% improvement on the hard split of the Kitty data set. We also experimented by adding image to image translation to reduce the appearance gap. And even here, we saw that there was a performance boost, meaning that appearance is not the only difference in the two domains of synthetic and real data. So here are some qualitative results. These are some random real images from Kitty. Here are images from the probabilistic grammar. And here are the corresponding images from medicine. And we see that the results are well aligned and always well spaced for all objects in the scene. We also see that the downstream task model results in much lower false positives and false negatives in the performance. So ultimately, I would like to stress on this view of parameterizing data and learning the right parameter distributions. And with an expressive parameterization, you can learn very large and diverse synthetic data sets, which is great for us, I guess. So please come to our poster, and our code will be made available soon. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tamawa Chaham, and I'll present the work SINGEN, Learning a Generative Model from a Single Natural Image, which was done jointly with Tali Dekel and Tomo Michaeli. Unconditional GANs have shown remarkable progress. However, learning to generate high-quality, complex scenes requires a very large data set. But what if we have only a single image? We introduced SINGEN, a powerful generative model that can be trained just from a single natural image. Given only a single training image, SINGEN is able to generate high-quality, diverse samples that carry the same visual content as the image. Our model is unconditional and does not require any object class label or external data. This allows us to deal with general natural scenes. Once trained, Singen can produce diverse, high-quality image samples of arbitrary dimensions, which semantically resemble the training image, yet contains new object configuration and structures. User studies show that our generated images are often confused to be real images. 
Syngan is resolution agnostic and can be easily applied to high definition images. Here are four megapixel samples. But why is it good to have a single image GAN? Once trained, Syngan can be used for many tasks. All are solved with the same unified approach and without any additional information or further training. And again, with only a single image example. So how does it work? Syngan is built from a pyramid of fully convolutional patch GANs. Generation starts at the coarser scale and sequentially passes through all generators up to the finest scale. Random noise is injected in each scale. This allows producing diverse fine structures that do not appear in the upscale version of the previous scale. We train each model to capture the patch statistic of the real image at a different image scale. This is done adversarially with a pyramid of patch discriminators, which attempts to classify each of the image patches as real or fake. Thus, in each scale, our training set is essentially the set of all overlapping patches within the real image at that scale. All the generators and discriminators have the same receptive field and thus capture structure of different sizes within the image. The multi-scale architecture allows control over the diversity of the generated samples. When starting the generation from the coarser scale, we get highly varied samples. However, we can start the generation from a finer scale and inject a down sample version of the training image as an input. This way, we can modify only finer image features. This is useful when the image contains one large silent object and we want to keep its global structure intact. Here, for example, only the zebra stripes get modified. Alternatively, after training, we can choose to inject a different image into the train model. Singan imposes the patch distribution of the training image, thus producing an image-to-image -image translation effect but with only a single training example. This property can be used for many image manipulation tasks. For example, we train Singan on this image and then inject this pane to the second coarser scale. The result is a realistic image that contains the global structure of the paint, but the appearance of the training image. Similarly, we can input, input an edited version of the training image. Singan translate this edit into a coherent and photorealistic structures. We can also harmonize an object into the training image. Singan tailors the pasted object texture to match the background. Singan can be also used for super resolution. As opposed to other methods trained only on a single image, like deep image prior and zero shot super resolution, Singan produces much sharper reconstructions. Surprisingly, evaluation shows that Singan performs similarly to SRGAN, although SRGAN was exposed to more than 300,000 images during training. Another application is animation from a single image. Here we use a random walk in Singan's Latin space to produce smoothly varying video clips. The effect is that these still images can be brought to life. Please visit us at postal number 15. Thank you. Uh, we would like to ask you to remain seated during the Q&A session. Yes, please remain seated after, uh, out of respect to the authors. Uh, two quick notes. We skip paper 14 because that is one of the best paper honorable mention papers uh, or awards, and they gave the talk on Tuesday. And um, the Syngan paper was also awarded the Best Paper Mar Prize Award. Questions, please? Yeah, go ahead. For Syngan, how long does it take for each image? So uh, as far as I understand, Syngan have to be uh, overfitted for one image. Right, so per single training image, like you train it on a single image, it takes about 30 minutes. Um, on a 2080 GPU. For the Metasim paper, um, can you comment a little bit about 
the limitation of this probabilistic scene graph representation using in terms of how well does it capture more global phenomena like relationship between objects or objects and their context, things like that. Right, for sure. So in the probabilistic scene graph itself, when there is a sampling, it does not capture this phenomena. And therefore, our model is actually trained to capture the phenomena. But other uh, limitations include having to actually define this grammar, which is in itself not so easy. But that's future work for us. And I, I hope we will be able to generate grammars automatically. Thank you. For Singan. Um, some questions from Slido. How does the method handle multiple images if you have like a series of related or unrelated images, as well as if you have some ideas about extensions to video? Um, okay, so we didn't try it on multiple images. Um, however, you can train it, you can try to expand it to um, multiple images. Um, it will generate probably images um, that contain structures and texture from all the images um, in your batch. Oh, a question over here. The same question about Singan. Uh, do you have something like early stopping or uh, due to overfitting of your GAN? So um, we do not suffer from overfitting because um, both the model is pretty lightweight. It cannot, it cannot memorize the real image by itself. And also, both gen the generator and um, the discriminator have small receptive field. They, all, they only see um, a small patches within the size of 11 by 11 at each scale. They never see the, the full image. Um, so you don't have the problem of overfitting in this case. There's anybody else? Um, another question. Where? It's a question from the audience. OK, go ahead. <laughs> Again, for a question for Singan. And you mentioned that you could have the latent space. Uh, you simply use a random latent vector, 2D vector. Uh, have you analyzed what meaning that those latent vectors can have on the images, especially when you use them for different images? Because you showed that uh, when you insert a previous image, you can just transfer the style of your tra training image using the latent vector. but I was wondering whether you could use that latent vector somehow to get better synchronization of styles. So the latent space has a meaning only per image. So for example, we can travel along this latent space and to produce um, short video clips or to produce random samples within that latent space. But two latent space of two different uh, images would not um, necessarily correspond to the same um, attributes. I see. Thank you. Okay, this concludes the session. Let's thank again to all the speakers. <laughs>